Tiny mm-hmm. Constant Worlds is a meta disjointed journey through the Dark Tower series by Stephen King, and we read so much not Stephen King Dark Tower books. I'm Taryn. I they them, but uh, I, at this point, I don't even know who I am anymore in this new old person world of mine. I'm Cat. She, her, and Amazon thinks that I need large print keyboards. Just, I mean, well, you you had a birthday by now. I have, yeah. So you're officially older. Uh, yeah, I am. We are in that portion of the like four months of the year where <laughs> you're older. So you're ancient. I'm, I'm also young, wiser. So young and spry. That's you're always wiser. That's fine. <laughs> Be wiser, young and spry. And yet I'm not the one who just had a procedure done. That's fair. <laughs> I did. I uh, I will warn everybody that I'm not on my A-game. They um, lie. They, they're actually probably more on their A-game than before. No, that's, well, because I'm, I'm still getting over it. Uh, but I'm, I'm coming out from having, like, big time stuff. Uh, but... I'm good, and yeah, I'm doing a lot better than I was before. Like, so much, just, yeah. It's and just wild. so no one thinks I'm a slave driver, we did take a break. We we oh, have yeah. a little recording gap in there. Maybe I was the slave driver. Maybe I'm slave, maybe I'm doing it to myself, you know? Maybe so. everybody thinks I'm the one. Nobody thinks I'm the one. <laughs> <laughs> everyone knows either way they got appropriate time to go and heal and this is kind of one of the tests to see if they can sit up for yeah, a bit my my doctor's note is has run out now and i haven't got a new one yet so it doesn't matter like I, medical care and and capitalism don't go together anyway they weren't going to give you even an ounce of wiggle room cat only gives me so much sick time and i'm out of it <laughs> So, <laughs> this is still America. It is. It is. I ran out of PTO a long time ago. <laughs> and since we are a small business, FMLA doesn't count here. Like, don't qualify for it, so. We also have no income. So, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's all expenses. Oh my goodness. Yeah, I... I get paid in like I don't I get paid in not joy. Stephen King books. Yeah, joy, that's fair too. You get paid in laughs. And getting to make jokes. <laughs> I've I have used up my stock of like I I don't I there's been a whole period of time where I ran out of my like joke allowance. <laughs> And that was a dark period. You know what? You get to practice here for when you do finally go do the stand-up night. Eh. You got to do the stand-up night. Don't. If you put it out publicly, then I'm going to end up locked into it. Maybe that's what needs to happen. Maybe. (laughs) We'll see what happens. So we are continuing to read it. It is a triggering book. There are quite a number of triggers I am about to provide to you. This is not all of the triggers. But, you know, we're going to do our best. In this book and this episode, we got child death, racial slurs, racism, death, bullying, child abuse, sexual content, murder, violence, domestic abuse, homophobia, gore, suicide, fat phobia, animal cruelty, and death, anti-Semitism, misogyny, pedophilia, sexual assault, and I'm sure plenty fucking more. I'm sorry, I couldn't include them all. Yeah, it almost feels like the list is triggering. A little bit. I'm not going to lie. At this point, this is, you know. Yeah. Uh, I, I think I think that, yeah, at this point, I'm a little triggered by the list of triggers. Yeah. I dropped out of this section. I'm going to try to join back in in the next section. But just with my own shit that's been going on. And to be quite frank. For how triggering the subject, well, not even triggering, but just how intense the subject material is and then how boring this section was, <laughs> it wasn't it wasn't worth the trade-off. So there was a point that I finally just went, yeah, I'm not finishing this section. And we, we encourage you to protect your mental health, 
that means even if you start reading it, if you drop out, that's okay too. Yep. Always put yourself first. Yeah. Because no one else is going to. Even if you think they are, they're probably not. They're going to put themselves first. And they probably should. Yeah, if they are putting you first, that's actually probably a red flag. Yeah, yeah. Put yourself first. Yeah. And we move forward. On that subject, then, we we continued reading it, and we read all of Chapter 3 and Interlude 3. I will say, reading this book right now, it, you know, especially because we are just talking about being old, kind of hits. <laughs> Right. The characters are a little older than we are, but not by a lot. No. <laughs> we almost could have run into it 27 years ago and had any memory of it. Yeah. And not just died. We, oh, we'd probably have died. I don't know about you, but I had friends who were older than me. I also had friends who were younger than me, but I had friends who were older than me. And this feels a lot like some, like the people that I ran with at that time. Yeah. Like just the people that I knew who were in that older set, both when they were younger and then as adults. So. Yeah. Yeah. We all know a member of the losers club. Yes. You're all also a member of the losers club. Oh my God. Sorry. Not sorry. (laughs) No. And if you're not a member of the losers club, fuck you. You actually are. You just don't. Know which one yet. No, like, if you were cool, <laughs> like, if you weren't a member of the Losers Club and you were, like, cool, fuck you. <laughs> so let me just say that uh, no one told us life would turn out this way. <laughs> I thought you were going to say the thoughts and feelings expressed <laughs> by, by members of this podcast are, do not constitute this pod, like, the business as a whole. <laughs> also... Either way. Also, fuck friends. I have had time off and I came with my opinions newly steeled and strengthened. So, one one distinct feeling that comes off of chapter three (laughs) is, uh... What, you want to talk about the book now? (laughs) I'm sure we're going to tangent into God knows what. But yeah, one of the distinct feelings you get through chapter three is that you can never go back home. Which I certainly can agree with. Derry has changed. Bill gets to see it firsthand, just how different it's all become. Mike arranges to meet him at a street that has been renamed because there's a mall there now. Which in 2023 is another dying creation, oddly enough. So that's kind of funny. In a really... I don't even know what type of way. Malls came and went. (laughs) I feel like they're also kind of coming back or what malls kind of were. But I, I think so I, I laugh because the idea of renaming a street because of a mall is funny, but then my brain is like, Ooh, red. No, that's exactly what I thought of too. And what is red? If not what people thought malls would be in the future just outside and not all within a building when i say red i'm referring to the reno entertainment district also called red that they have we have a red district (laughs) it's not that cool i hate um you want to talk about another steel backed opinion that i have that is for we i need a whole separate what is the one from family guy like grinds my gears or whatever the yeah. fuck i need that i just need one of those for everything that's not related to this <laughs> that i just have like fucking strong opinions on because that shit's it's not that i don't like red i just don't understand also yeah why like cl- they were going for something with that name because everybody knows what you come or Everybody jokes about what you come to Nevada for. Yeah. So to name it Red is like... They they knew what they were doing. And what's funny is that they unnamed that street, Park Lane, for what was previously there, a big mall called the Park Lane Mall, yeah. and renamed it Experience Way. <laughs> Just the yeah. dumbest fucking name. And I'm sorry if you're the person that pitched that name. That was a bad choice. And again, if you are somebody who was of the impression that you can come to Nevada or someplace like Las Vegas and get illegal prostitutes, you cannot do that within city limits. There is illegal prostitution here, but not within city limits. 
they that is a misconception about the state. Uh, I understand it's the only state in the United States that has legal sex work. I shouldn't be saying prostitution. That's a really outdated term. It is the only state in the country that has legal, like that kind of legal sex work. There's other kinds of legal sex work everywhere. Not within city limits, but I do feel like they're playing off of that idea, especially being so close to the wild orchid. Yeah. So, oh, feels. Also, legalized sex work. Sex work is work. Absolutely. Well, what Bill finds is not <laughs> legal sex work. I, I didn't think you were even going to segue. I thought you were just going to keep going. Bill takes a cab and he doesn't give enough time because dairy has grown up so much that there's more people that the short trip now takes fucking forever because he gets stuck in gridlock. So there's a lot of banks. <laughs> <laughs> there's so many banks and dairy <laughs> you might think yeah it's, it's just time dilation between being a child and now being an adult but the the cabbie also expresses frustration with all of the the banks causing all the employees to take lunch at the same time creating traffic the cabbie was also super fucking annoying and he keeps repeating himself and i'm not gonna lie i really was getting sick of his fucking catchphrase but he keeps saying again and again at the end of every sentence pardon my french if you're a religious man and the only way i kept like made it through that was i kept thinking of the secretary of state and idiocracy and has brought to you by and i won't say the <laughs> restaurant's name because fuck that restaurant um so they pay him every time <laughs> Mike Judge. Mike Judge movie. Idiocracy. You should definitely watch it. It's got a Wilson brother, Maya Rudolph's in it, and Terry Crews, and Stephen Root. Um, and, and Stephen Root's drastically underrated. He's only in it briefly, but he's hilarious. I can't handle Idiocracy right now because it's it's <laughs> it's just too... Brought to you by Many Constant Worlds. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So Bill makes it to the agreed upon restaurant where the party has assembled and is waited on by a woman named Rose. Interesting. Thought you might like that. I don't know how far you made it, but. Oh yeah, yeah I'm, I'm past there. Fantastic. On the drive over, Bill did pass a store selling a bunch of D&D stuff. So we know that Stephen King is aware of D&D for sure. Now, definitively, we know he's aware of it. Yeah. In the 80s, whether it's because he played it or because of his sons playing it. And as I have been reading Nosferatu, I can tell you, I'm pretty sure Joe Hill played d and I'm pretty positive that he's really, uh, that he's very familiar with d and as it was in the mid 80s, or as it was into the mid 80s. I'm I'm excited. I'm excited yeah. for for where it's where yeah. we're going. So so I have asked, like, I wanted to make this fun. I asked Taryn to class each person prior to this this recording, and we are going to reveal to each other what class do we think the losers are. So I got a little extra, and I looked up what like what Dungeons and Dragons were out by the time this was being written. And classed them according to what was available because I wanted to class them how I thought Stephen King would have classed them. And I found some really interesting information. <laughs> and I won't lie, I did that because I couldn't make a decision on classing them myself, just like with with like 5e and everything. It was too hard and I didn't want to decide. Okay. So I decided to decide it. I want to do this in semi-organized manner. Okay. So let's start with our main character, Bill. I classed him as a paladin. Okay. What did you give him? I almost went paladin as well. I was very close to paladin. I ended up giving him cleric. Okay. And I, I could went, see it. I went cleric because in the versions of D&D that were out up until this was written, Cleric had been created specifically to counter a vampire character and to go against the undead. There was a specific vampire character that the Cleric character had been created to go against. And it's, it's, there's this giant pair, like... The cleric character is based on an actual historical character named Roland, which that's a whole other <laughs> thing that I about 
fucking died when I found. And it, it was... Like, he also is horsed. Like, it's a horse riding, you know, like Hi-Ho Silver. It's a horse riding specific. Like, it's not even like clerics, how we have them now. Yeah. If we were going off of 5e, though, I probably would have gone, like, hard paladin. But based on what they had then, I I think Stephen King was real familiar with Dungeons and & Dragons. And I think that Bill is just cleric, like, he is meant to be that. All right, so Beverly. Beverly was one that I couldn't make a hard decision on. So I multi-classed Beverly. I gave her Barbarian and Ranger. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. no, that's smart. Because I could not pick one, but I'm like, she's she's a very, like, quick on her feet thinker. Like, she's she's able to do quite a bit, and she's a, she's resourceful. Like that fight yeah. with Tom, she got very resourceful in getting away from him. What I started giving her was Rogue. So okay. I think that makes sense. Which I think, so originally it was a thief, but I also was starting to lean like Druid. For her, which back in the old days, you couldn't just go into Druid. You had to, you had to multi-class to Druid because you had to start out earlier. Yeah. And then level up into Druid, which makes sense for Beverly if she starts as like a rogue and then grows and moves into that. And I think I went Druid because she ends up like with kind of more psychic link, like more, yeah, like the more empathetic of them. Um, but Rogue was where I had started to kind of lean with her. Ranger makes sense too. And I think Ranger would lean more into if she... If she goes druid later, which yeah. I, I think makes sense for her. As, but I have somebody else who's a druid on this list, <laughs> too, who I started out with something else. So Richie. Richie was easy. Bard? Yes, Bard. <laughs> okay. yeah. Bard, yep. he's the entertainer. He's keeps, the entertainer. <laughs> keeps What I wrote is keeps the group's morale up and buffs them through entertaining, debuffs enemies through the same. Yep, yep. That's very Richie. <laughs> Eddie. Eddie, I, I had his cleric. Okay. So the the way that they used to write all magic users, it eventually would split, but it was just called magic user because Gary Gygax didn't want to use the term wizard and warlock because of the bad associations with it. Yeah. Fits him a lot. So the magic user was physically weak and vulnerable, but compensated for this with the potential to develop spell cat. Oh, this is all from Wikipedia, by the way. To develop powerful spell casting abilities and practice a mid to high level magic user was a combination intelligence gatherer and walking artillery, gathering information about possible dangers not yet seen, and augmenting the physical combat abilities of the other classes with potentially devastating long range and area attacks. What I had originally figured, too, was, like, Cleric, because he, he could heal, right? Yeah. I don't think Eddie ever really does that. No, and, and I think it's hard, because, like, in the book, we have not seen a lot of Eddie do anything. I think yeah. we're I think we're going to see it in the upcoming sections. I tried my best to keep the movie out of it, but at mo I know it's in there. I know that's part of what probably goes into that, because he does, he does suggest things that are yeah. based on... His mother's like Munchausen, or is that Munchausen by proxy? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Based on the things that she would tell him. And, and I think he's made a couple of offhand comments about the things his mom had told him about various shit. Eddie's one I have a feeling I, I will probably end up changing by the end of this book. Yeah, me too. Because it really depends. Will that pay off? I just saw him as being support to yes. the others so much. And because I'm looking at it through what was available at the time, this, that class, the magic user class, is very much meant as the support class. Yeah. Like, I'm handing you what you need from back here, and I might throw a rock out from behind the bush <laughs> at some point. Yeah. And that felt very eddy. I felt I, within his wheelhouse. I can agree with that. Just for you and for the listeners, you can always remember Munchausen versus Munchausen by proxy. Munchausen is when it's you. By proxy is when you're proxying it to someone else. That's how you know. <laughs> 
So the next person, <laughs> I also multi-classed again, and it was Mike. Mike, I have as a wizard and a druid. Yeah, Mike's, Mike's okay. my, my druid. Okay. I initially went wizard, but once I saw how druids were in the olden days, like original druids, I'm like, no, this is, yeah. he is meant to be a druid. I even wrote, I wrote druid. Knee Jerk was wizard, but his connection to the mystical bird, because they had those connections. Yes. Uh, his innate magic and the studying he does and the way druids were in advanced dungeons and dragons first edition and then i put the quote in order to reach some of the higher levels players had to defeat a higher level druid in combat and some of the first shit he does as a historian is have to go after the other historians and like out history them <laughs> like a real world like defeating the other dairy druids there can be only one basically (laughs) and as soon as i read that i'm like oh yeah you you are a real world druid rather than a wizard or maybe they didn't have wizards functioning like how they do stephen king sees librarians as druids i think i think so too that's why he had to go defeat the one who was, like, in the hospital. <laughs> and that's why the one guy was like, okay, start with those two dudes. And he's like, but they're terrible. He's like, yeah, I'm not saying they're good. Start with them and then throw out everything they said. <laughs> the next one is Ben. Got nothing for Ben. So I, there was no not using 5e for this. I had to go Artificer. It Like, he is okay. really creative and figuring shit out. And while I think that Maybe if we went old old school enough, you'd probably find that in something like a rogue because they're also very creative. Ben himself is just so focused on yeah. Beverly and building. <laughs> ben, I had almost put as like a paladin. Yeah. With Beverly as his like thing <laughs> that is his like yes. oath, I guess. Oh, or like his his patron. Because while he does do a lot with the building, he's just Everybody sees Ben as just this super innately good dude. Yeah. Always, all the time. And yeah. when he puts his mind to something, he can always do it. But it always comes from that place of just goodness. Constant goodness. And I realize that Paladin's room was that. I guess that could also be a cleric. With Bill and with Ben, they were so similar, I think. Bill is so much more focused on fighting, I guess. Yeah. Whereas Ben is, he, Ben feels more focused on what is right and on these are my friends and this is our group. Like, Ben legitimately reminds me of a, I cannot remember her name, but Ashley Johnson's character from Vox Machina. Oh, Pike. Pike, yes. Legitimately Ben reminds me of Pike. I could see that, yeah. Which I guess would be a cleric. But I think in the older versions, it was more of a paladin. Yeah. But I'm not great at the classes. Yeah, this is just fun anyway, so it's it's fine. No, for sure. Ben is very much, he, he, for me at least, makes me think a lot of like that stereotypical like knight. Yes. Like he is a white knight. He is exactly what he's supposed to be. He is all good in all ways. He's super smart. He eventually becomes super attractive. Super wealthy. He's everything. I I think Ben is this idea of what supposedly women want. And it's not like there's anything wrong with Ben. No. The problem is is that there's there's room in between yeah (laughs) it's not like you have to try and be this pinnacle and you also have to be an underdog from the fact that you went from being like the fattest kid to being the most handsome dude yeah it doesn't necessarily need to be that way yeah i'm i'm interested to see if as we move through the book there's more gray area with Ben. Yeah. Because his only fault really seems to be kind of overindulgence. Yeah. And once he learns discipline, he's amazing. Yeah. Which is, it. it's, I think that's made it difficult to pin him as a character because he doesn't have much of a character. No, he really doesn't. I, I have to agree. Yeah. Ben 
I, it's almost like the story could have been written without him. Yeah. And it really wouldn't have changed much. We could have put a lot of what happens with Ben onto just Bill. Yeah. This, this was just kind of, to this point, Ben has seemed like a character we could have gotten rid of. I feel like a lot of his stuff could have also been given to Mike or to Richie. Like, I, there's so many people that his info could have been split between, but Stephen King wanted the little fat boy. Yeah. He didn't want it to be any of these other people. Ben's biggest thing is overindulgence. I think that he was also trying to do like a seven deadly sins thing. Yeah. Where we have obviously gluttony, Beverly, given what we know later, lust, and and the way that she's just objectified constantly, even by herself. And Bill, pride, because he starts to get really weirdly personal with it targeting Georgie. And it it fucked up his life quite a bit. Oh, yeah. So I I can't blame him, but there is kind of a weirdness to it and they have to all kind of get over yeah they don't progress until they move past these things yeah well last character is stan and i just put force ghost because i don't know jack shit about stan really yet that was another one that i struggled to class i think i i had started going the route of druid again Mm -hmm. but i think it was I think it was because he had the experience with all of the dead boys. Yeah. And because he had such a strong reaction to finding out about it. Yeah. It feels like he is more sensitive then. But I just couldn't couldn't place him yet. I, I think we need to see more Stan. Yeah, I agree. So I guess we'll find out what happens. Yeah. Because no, Druid, I think, is a solid solid pick, especially because of the birds. Yeah, I and- think that was the other thing. So now <laughs> we still just really have to watch Stranger Things. Uh, yeah, I guess so. Because it's, it's just everything we just talked about, I'm pretty sure. I don't know. I'm not, I don't know. I'm not feeling the Stranger Things vibe. I've heard it's really good. I every have time to. I try to watch it, I just, I don't. I get bored thinking about it. Yeah, I just do something else. Yes. Yes. So, anywho, so the group eats, catch up, and they have to face the elephant in the room, which is why they're all there. Mike tells them that they have to remember all the details on their own eventually. I'm so sorry. I thought for a second you said that the group ate ketchup. (laughs) And I was like, well, I don't remember that. What? The group did not, in fact, eat ketchup. No, no. Sorry. I didn't mean to break your flow. I was going, what is, what? Whoa. <laughs> Either way, Mike does tell them yeah. they have to try and take it down again, and that's it with a capital I. Um, he admits they may not succeed, but they have to try. Uh, Mike tells them that nine kids have already died this cycle, which all are surprised to have heard nothing about. Here we do get a reference to Frank Dodd, a king character from the Dead Zone and the city of Castle Rock. He's referenced in other stories as well. Bev also mentions that the Atlanta child murders, which I know nothing about. Karen, do you know anything about those? So I, I don't yet. What I can say is that the Atlanta child murders took place between 1979 and 1981. And that I am going to have more information on that probably for our next episode. Because okay. this episode... I came armed with the information that I promised last episode, which is about John Wayne Gacy. Okay. So our true crime corner this episode is going to be making up for what I promised last episode. (laughs) Next episode, I'll bring up the Atlanta child murders. I think Stephen King either noticed he had kids and was really bothered or had been bothered for a while. And this is the answer to that. I also don't know, and I, I've been kind of keeping an eye out for anything that might have happened while he was a kid that could have sparked some of this. As I was looking into Gacy, it is clear to me that he lifted. Well, I don't want to say lifted. I think that it was very in the public conscience at that time. So it might have been a thing of it was in his mind as he was just writing but there are a lot of 
bits and pieces of that story throughout this story. The clown is actually one of the smallest or smaller ones, at least to me. Yeah. Again, just to repeat that, that was nine children who, who have died. So nine's back again. Nine never goes away. No. Mike notes that all the losers have become winners. They're all successful and rich, but childless. Everyone is uncomfortable with their success, and Mike's, Mike tells them not to be. They had no control over their departures from Derry as children. That as children, they were like baggage to their parents. While Mike may have stayed behind, he holds no ill will towards them and doesn't want them to downplay their success. Because he does... He... He is a librarian and your librarians are underpaid. And they were then, they are now. Your librarians are underpaid for the bullshit you make them deal with. Your librarians and your teachers. Yes. I realize we're not talking about teachers, but while we're on the subject, your teachers too. Your librarians and your teachers. Yep. So it, it just is what it is. And Mike is accepting of that, I think, because he enjoys what he does. Yeah. He does tell everybody about Stan. He explains that their circle may not be enough this time with one less person, but they may be able to form a new one still. Eventually, fortune cookies come and they are filled with terrors. And no, it's not just a really Ooh. crappy fortune. <laughs> Bill realizes that the spooky bits only they seem to be able to see. So when Rose comes, he insists everyone behave normally, which they do. And she's she's a little bit, like, confused by their normalcy, assuming that Rose is not a player in a different way. And she is legitimately unable to see them. So you mean she's not Rose the Hat? <laughs> I don't know. Well, that, we're, we're getting into... We're getting there. <laughs> yeah. So once they're all done, they split the party up, which is a terrible choice. But, you know, they do what they do. They are instructed to go basically to the place in Derry that is kind of theirs, where they feel strongest, places that they identify with. We have now moved into parts that I'm, that I, oh, we are, we are in a new territory now. Yeah. yeah. I made it through the restaurant and I'm like, I can't, I, I cannot. (laughs) Mike does warn them that they may not always know where that place is. And he he just suggests, just let your feet do the walking. The only rule is, don't go to the Barrens. That is a place they have to all go together. They may go do their side quests in town and gather their supplies. But before this ending into the dungeon, no Leroy Jenkins. That is the point of no return. That is the point of no return. You must save your game now. Once you go past this point, you will not be able to access the rest of the town. So Ben is up first. Ben goes to the library because he's a nerd. Here, it finds him and presents itself as a vampire. It also leaves a balloon saying it killed the previous librarian. Eddie wanders about a neighborhood for a bit and eventually ends up uh, where kids used to play baseball. Not him, but other kids. (laughs) Eddie pretty much ends up in a zombie movie. One interesting note popped up here, and it's the kid Belch Huggins is noted to have beat up a kid whose name was Owen Phillips. And I can only assume that this kid is named after King's youngest son, Owen Philip King. <laughs> I don't know why his kid got to be the one beat up. <laughs> that's I. Thanks, Dad. <laughs> maybe that's what he wanted. Maybe I think his kid was like seven, so maybe that's a weird. I. You know what? Not my business. Not my. Naomi got to be a dog sled driver and. Owen got to be beat up by one of the bullies in Derry. Yeah, but she didn't get to marry the prince, which was also interesting. It's like, no, you're going to be with a normal guy. Look, I want you to marry Peter Strub's son. You're going to marry Ben. That's what's going to happen. I can't. Okay. <laughs> you know, we, I can't, we can't go back. We can't go back. We can never go back. That is the point of this section. <laughs> That's the point of the whole book. It is. Yeah. Life is never what you thought it was. Bev goes to the, the first to the laundromat and then, of course, to her old apartment. Her dad is dead and gone, but an old lady lets her in, it, only for the twist to be that it was empty building all along. <laughs> yeah, she basically gets attacked, as Beverly tends to get stuck with a lot. And well, honestly, the scene really is similar to the movie, the 2017, no, 
2017 and 2019 movies, so the 2019 movie. Well, I, I, Beverly has titties. That's her job is to get... Yeah. Like, I will say that she, in the book, she's at least a little more wise to the weirdness earlier on. That's nice. Maybe, maybe in the movie she was too, but she was playing along to get information and they just didn't make that very clear. It, it's very possible based on everything that we've read in the future, because so much of it ha- has only been in the future. Yeah. I think they had to cram so much into that movie. There just wasn't time. Yeah, I think so too. I think it was a weird, now that I have read more of the book, I think it was a weird decision to do the movies the way that they did because so much material is missed. Yes, I, I agree. Because, like, one of the things that's, like, given her, like, a weird vibe with this lady is just, like, the decorations in the house. And I did actually want to mention that because the woman, Mrs. Kirsch, because she, at first she thinks that the button still says Marsh on it. Yeah. And, like, when the woman answers, it no longer says that. But one of the things she notes is that this woman has a picture of Jesus and JFK, and obviously together i think they're like next to each other (laughs) um (laughs) because that video on youtube that i like from so long ago like (laughs) the jfk like animation it has jfk and jesus together so i'm like hmm So, I, I, obviously, we know that uh, 112263 is a book, you know, on the JFK thing that Stephen yeah. King wrote. But the thing is, is that in The Stand, Randall Flagg mentions that he talked to V. Oswald. Lee Harvey Oswald. That's the guy's name. Yeah. I'm of the impression he does like, Randall Flagg does not appear in 112263. But, I don't know. That, that picture. Obviously, JFK left a mark. On Stephen King. I don't know what mark, but it's some kind of something. According to my grandma, that uh, that day left a mark on everybody. Yeah. Because when the president gets assassinated, that's a big deal. Any, I mean, whether you supported him or not, it's still a crazy. Yeah. Like, it's a wild moment for you in history. So. And wasn't it televised? Oh, yeah. Well, I don't know. I don't believe that it was, like, nationally televised or anything. The, like, motorcade that he was on. It's just that there was, there were people out there filming as he was going past Mm -hmm. that day. It has been televised many times since then. But it wasn't, like, a thing that everybody was watching on TV at the time. But it was on every newspaper. It was a big deal. Yeah. The news cut in. Like, I, I mean, really, really imagine if the president just suddenly died, like not even assassinated, but if the president just died today and the vice president had to take over, imagine what news that would be and how shocking that would be for the nation. Now imagine somebody assassinated the president, actually successfully assassinated the president. And in this case, like he, like there was a reason they called it Camelot, like the the country was divided but it just the 60s were wild <laughs> the 60s were fucking wild like again that that's a whole other podcast but i'm not the i mean he was alive at that time and i uh king was born in 47 i believe so yes so he would have been 16 i think in 63 yeah I can't even imagine having something that formative happen when I was 16. I mean, we were 12 when, when the twin towers went down and that's still such a huge deal. So 16, when the president is fucking assassinated and then Lee Harvey Oswald is assassinated like two or three days later by Jack Ruby. That was, I think his name was Jack Ruby. That was, I I should know this. (laughs) I mean, you know more than I do. It was, it was wild shit. It was absolutely wild shit. Yeah. It it was crazy shit. I, that alone would make sense why it would be such a, such an event that would impress on somebody so hard. It impressed on everybody who was in, in the country, in the world at that time, but especially in the country. I don't want to say in the world, like, there were probably people who don't give a shit about America. (laughs) But, 
feel like people who like anybody who had to do with America at the time were like, whoa, what the fuck? So the secret is that the building was empty all along. Beverly gets chased out by it. She does. She does manage to escape, though. It's a pretty triggering chapter. So if you skipped it or if you still haven't read it and you're thinking about it, you might want to skip Beverly's chapter. I think I end up skipping a lot of Beverly's chapters. Richie, meanwhile, goes to the Paul Bunyan statue, which he had the experience with it when he was a kid that he never shared with anybody, to the point that even when they were, like, sorting out where everybody was going to go, Richie still insisted nothing ever happened to him. There is also a guy with his kid at the statue. When Richie starts hearing the voice of it, the dad doesn't notice it, but the toddler definitely does. So he manages to escape it again as well and loses his contact. That's such a weird, like... (laughs) thing to lose like all my contacts have just fallen out of my eyes (laughs) he has to go back to when he was 11 with big ass glasses of course i you of course yeah but i do like the idea that they can still hear it because they're like still kids at heart or some shit maybe it's having a child that like converts you since you know none of them had children so he could still like connect i i think i do think (laughs) that some of like what the message is which I, I, as someone who is infertile, I do not appreciate that messaging. Fuck Stephen King for that shit. Just because I, I don't, I, I think people should be able to talk about that a little bit more, and that shouldn't be a hush hush thing. So I don't really give a shit. But fuck him for that messaging. Like, not cool. If that's what the messaging is, I won't lie. I to this point, I have kind of taken it more as they are so traumatized and so scared by what can happen to kids yeah, that they mentally are because of the way it was described in Patricia and Stan's chapter of like, you know, some people are just, they just kind of freak out and then they can't do it. Which by the way, is the kind of reasoning that leads to, well, you know, if it's not legit, the body has ways of shutting that down. Yeah. Which also fuck Stephen King for. So, so I will say, I don't think that his intention was to to go that route. Yeah. Uh, because he mentions in Ben's chapter, Ben is, like, observing some kids because he's in the library. Yeah. He's observing them and he talks about how kids believe in this invisible world. Yeah. And so I do think it's a lot more, like, leaning toward, like, you have to stay open. Yeah. And that these guys have stayed open to it because they've seen the horrors that could happen. They are capable of connecting with with this other side yeah and like this we i know we've talked a little bit about roland's world but dark tower yeah roland's world being kind of a limbo or a purgatory already and that's like why jake is there and in in the vein of my ego id super ego theory i would suggest that roland's world is like a landscape of the mind and delane is like this quintessential like fairy tale Roland is the product of King's love of Westerns. Um, The Pursuit of the Tower is an epic quest. And the tower itself, I mean, I don't know what the tower is just yet. Um, But if the invisible world is the imagination of a writer, you know, is it is it all Roland's world? So when he does like. When we die, does an imprint of us go to the invisible world because someone somewhere might remember us? And I do wonder if that's where some of this, like, connection comes in. Because all of them are successful and creative people. Every single one of them. I, even, I think Mike even talks about how Eddie turned driving other people into a business. Yeah. And how impressive that is. That he could shift it that way. Because even when we started this book, I mentioned that Eddie's didn't seem like it was very creative. And you argued that it was yeah. very successfully. But it doesn't seem like it. It is, though. Yeah. So, I, I don't know that he was necessarily going with, you're still a child if you've never had a child. Yeah. And, and that is, it's still a possibility. Stephen King, as we've learned, is not the best person maybe yeah no i i think you're right i i do think you you are more right that because they have they have seen that there are things that 
can't be explained and that there is another side that these kind of invisible things like they have seen the boogeyman and they know that the boogeyman is there so they can't like they can't, can't unsee it. Exactly. They can tr- block it out from trauma, but they can't unsee it. Exactly. I think, though, I, I do wonder if the idea is they, now they have like a magical, almost like a shine related ability to be like, yeah, I'm not having a kid. Um, you mean they have the touch? <laughs> <laughs> They've been touched by it. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. Or maybe it'll get explained more further in the book. I yeah. just know for now. All like even even reading that portion in the very beginning, that's where my mind went of like, God, all I hear is some old fucking senators being like, you know, the body, if it's not legitimate, <laughs> has ways of shutting that down. And I'm like, I but I'm I've been trying to give it time, but then they have this conversation. But that being said, I think it's gonna turn into more of a plot point than it is so far because the fact that Richie's vasectomy grew back. Right? So I I don't think it's going to be that simple. Yeah. I will say to this point, as a queer person, as an infertile queer person, I've just felt real insulted through the whole, like, first half of this book. And there hasn't been much rectifying of that it's just been like, yeah, fuck you. <laughs> Through the whole like first half, it just kind of felt like Stephen King doing double middle fingers. Like, I can do whatever the fuck I want. I'm Stephen King, and it's just going to get right through the editors. And in the 80s, for sure it was going to. I think even now it would. Yeah. So just waiting to see. <laughs> waiting to see if the next half of the book kind of. Well, we still have a podcast at the end of it. Tune in to find out. <laughs> How about, at the beginning of this podcast, I was saying Stephen King was daddy. So I'm waiting to see, like, by the end of the podcast, if I'm just like, this motherfucker. Like, to be I'm, fair, as you get older, you do learn that your parents aren't the people you thought they were. No, that's true. Well, but <laughs> daddy and dad are kind of two different things. Well, and I, okay, I need someone younger than me to explain what zaddy is, though. <laughs> Because I don't under, I don't know what that is. Is it maybe like a gender neutral approach? Because like daddy does sound better than mommy. No, I think it's a sex thing. Well, that's what I'm saying. Because the way you're using daddy anyway is meant to be a sex thing. So if we go zaddy, then that takes away some of the like gender to it, perhaps. That's hot. Uh, Because again, mommy, like mommy when used as a sex thing is a little weirder, especially because so many men have like unhealthy relationships with their mothers. It is, but but since there's been a line drawn between mommy and actual parents and daddy <laughs> and actual parents, I'm more okay with it. I'm like, oh no, like step on me, mommy, and like I'm gonna call my mom are two really different things now. I'm like, all right, cool. Like this is this is fine then. I when the Resident Evil lady <laughs> came out. And everybody was like, oh, she's mommy. All right, cool. I get it. It's not my thing, but I get it now and I can accept this more. Um, but okay, if if Zaddy is gender neutral, it is better than the other terms that I've heard. The problem is I need a non-sexual gender neutral parent term that isn't bad. Like all the ones I've ever heard are shitty and i need something for rocket to call me and i don't really want my dog to call me a sexy term (laughs) so what do you want your dog to call you i don't know that's the problem i've been trying to figure something out for like years it feels like so also could you some help with that if anybody has some ideas please pretty sure zaddy is a sex thing and I'm not going around being like rocket come to zaddy because that feels like not right I do have to say zaddy sounds better than zombie <laughs> exactly <laughs> zombie is not um that's not sexy you could go with zombie that sounds like a zombie mom <laughs> yeah <laughs> so Tina Belcher could make it, it sexy could be sexy to some oh my god <laughs> yes now I just hear Tina Belcher in my head 
like being like, oh, do you mean like a zombie, like a zombie mommy? Like, <laughs> oh my god, I can't. You're all terrible. That's a free idea, Bob <laughs> Burgers. I know everyone who works there is listening. You can have that idea. That one's free. It's your only freebie. <laughs> Bill is the only one who does not have an encounter with it on his little excursion through Derry. Because, you know, he's special like that. Bill instead ends up going to the drain where Georgie died. I want this short story where his bike has an encounter with it instead. <laughs> it's high <laughs> silver. It's like, it's good. <laughs> he doesn't encounter it, but instead a child. <laughs> There's only one thing worse. <laughs> so he talks to this kid and he learns that the child is like hearing the voices of it. And they, they chat for a bit. Bill unsuccessfully tries to skateboard. <laughs> <laughs> that was one thing the movie did really good. Was James McAvoy like, you gotta get out of the city. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't do that. <laughs> he doesn't do that. He doesn't traumatize a child. That is a shame. <laughs> That's like the best scene of that movie. Let, let's be clear. The, Richie and Bill do not traumatize this one kid in Derry. Because <laughs> there's like nothing else <laughs> happening in the whole street. It's like a sunny day. Everything's great. And he's just shaking the child. <laughs> you gotta get out of this town. Whatever you do, you do whatever it takes. And the kid's like, okay, dude. Yeah. yeah, that doesn't happen. I'm not going with you to a second location, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh. Anywho, so Bill ends up leaving. As he's leaving, he ends up passing another kid. And um, I believe this one was a girl. And he asks the, the kid, like, a store that they like. And she says she likes a secondhand store called Second Row, Second Clothes. And this is where he reunites with Silver. Bill takes Silver to Mike's, where Mike helps him get Silver's tires aired up. And they go to put some cards in it, because, you know, that's what people apparently did in the past. I've only ever seen this done on TV. I never understood it, but I think it's for the clicky noise. But re regardless, they're going to do this. And Mike pulls out a brand new pack of cards. They spill upon the floor, and two are face up. Both are two of spades. We will be talking about cardamancy shortly, but let's get through this summary. <laughs> Once the losers have had their childhood shattered, we shift over to Henry Bowers. He is in a facility called Juniper Hills. He was convicted of the murders of 1958. Uh, while he did kill his father, the others were obviously murdered by it. Uh, Henry seems to be aware of the fact that he was pegged because they needed someone to be responsible for the murders. I don't know what the procedure is typically with convicting a child because he is still a child. Like he's under 18. He is he is legally not an adult. It varies from state to state. How Henry Bowers was in high school though. He yeah. Well, not even, I, I think technically they would have still considered a middle school because he, he was held back. So he should have been in sixth grade going into seventh. He was going from fifth to sixth. So he had to have been like 13, 14, maybe. Also depends on the severity of the crimes. Mm -hmm. I, it actually depends a lot on the severity of the crimes usually. And again, it varies from state to state. According to the juvenile law center, which we can, we can. We'll link. Yeah, exactly. Starting in the 1990s. With the kind of, with the super offender myth, youth were, we, we started to try more and more youth as adults, mm -hmm. which I think is what we're more used to hearing. Yeah. This idea of like trying, trying youth as adults, but it certainly happened before then. It's more like it happens more often. I, off the top of my head, so I could be wrong. It happens specifically more often with black male children. It happens more often to boys than to girls. And how that would work is in each state, they have like an age that you have to hit before you can even, they can even consider trying you as an adult, usually. Okay. But it also usually has to do with how heinous the crime is. So if the crime is so horrific, 
that it's kind of considered that only an adult could have done it. But still, like, so if a five-year-old somehow heinously murders both their parents, there's almost no chance that a five-year-old is going to get tried as an adult, right? Yeah. But if a 10-year-old does it, much more likely that the 10-year-old is going to get tried as an adult. Because there's there's just this idea of, like, there's a point. Where you can, like, reason? Yeah, there's a point where in your brain you know that that there are consequences for your actions. Okay. That something is going to follow. Now, if a five-year-old does that, there is still... They're, they're not just going to get off scot-free. They're not just going to, yeah. like, go to a foster home. Now, they might go to a foster home, and it's going to be a specific kind. It's going to be with parents who are trained to take care of them and that kind of thing. But more than likely, they're going to go to some kind of, like, uh, mental health care place. That happened a lot more often before Ronald fucking Reagan. It all comes back to Reagan, guys. <sighs> it always comes back to Reagan. I don't I don't have words. If you want to know more about the awfulness, just just go. There's a podcast called Behind the Bastards. Any of the Reagan episodes. Just just search in your podcast app Behind the Bastards, Reagan, and listen to them. Because Ronald Reagan is like, yeah, it all comes back to Reagan. And in reality, not to Reagan, he had dementia. He had no idea what was going on most of the time. It was the people who were like, doing, yeah, it, it was all the people who were, oh my God. And his fucking wife, oh, Nancy Reagan, fuck me. Oh. Anyways, the reason that I say that it, Ronald Reagan is because uh, particularly in Ca I know in California I don't I, I believe that they did it nationally I know that he's the one who did it in California they like, closed uh, most of the mental institutions and kicked everybody out there's a joke about that in King of the Hill yeah I'm back shocked. to Mike Judge <laughs> yeah not shocked Mike Judge is quality god I hope so <laughs> so People who should be getting care, like the most vulnerable of us, aren't getting help. And instead, they're getting imprisoned. Mm -hmm. And then they, they get imprisoned, and then that's the only legal slavery. And fuck me, I hate everything all the time. That's not true. I actually am a pretty happy, positive person. I sound really angry because... Reagan really brings out the worst in them. Uh, that's true. Well, also, this podcast, we talk about a lot of shit that makes me mad. Might as well just call it Grind Terran's Gears. But... World, the, what the fuck? Oh my god, that could be a good name too. <laughs> but no, legitimately, like, it, it's just bullshit. But what happens to Henry Bowers in this book sounds like... He's tried and and the idea is even if it's all put on him as like this fall guy, it doesn't matter if he's tried as a youth or as an adult. They basically find him like criminally insane, which yeah. there's a lot of rules about. It sounds like once he turns 18, he gets moved into an adult mental institution where... It's where all, he's been the last 27 years. And all they really can do is trank you. And you don't get a choice. When people think that the insanity plea is an easy way out, no. Nope. Uh, you get no say in your medication. You don't ever get to leave. You get no say in what you do day to day. It's the same pretty much as being... It's not the same as being in prison, but... You just, you're going to get care because you're mentally unwell. I haven't made it to this part of the book, and I'm, I'm glad that I, I think I noped out at the right time. I think this probably would have been triggering for me. If Henry Bowers is in the movie like he is in the book, he probably needed exactly this. Well, and Henry Bowers is 
he he is astute about this for a character that when we see him as a child he's presented as kind of stupid that's why he gets held back and he he yeah. doesn't understand some basic stuff but it's cuz he's horribly abused at home yeah. which is why he he had like he does not pretend like he didn't kill his father he did kill his father yeah. his abusive piece of shit father and he is aware of the fact like they need somebody to take responsibility for all of these other murders and because he was so close, because the other bullies get killed, basically. They all die down in the sewers. His best friends all disappear and die. Damn. And he gets found with Patrick's belt. And it, his belt was in the closet. Because, I mean, I lend you stuff. You, yeah. you have stuff of mine in your room. I have stuff of yours in my room. Yeah. Like, this is really normal amongst friends. But when they go and they tear the house apart... They find one of like things that belong to his friends in his room and they go, oh, you must have killed all your friends. And yeah. then it's like, no, this is perfect. We can calm everybody down yep. by having a conviction because we'll just you you did the murders of 58. Oh, it yeah. was all all Henry Bowers. And he he's aware of this. Like he's thinking about how they it was it. And they need but they need me to take the fall for this. And he doesn't seem to fight it. He, he honestly, maybe he just really needed to kill his dad to be a better person. Yeah. <laughs> he got some of that anger out. He is, he is oddly astute about the fact that he's going down for this murder. He doesn't, doesn't sound like he really tried to fight it. I can't imagine he had much representation since, you know, we don't really hear about his mom. His yeah. dad, he is now killed. Who's there to defend Henry Bowers? There are also some people who do better. Yeah. And if they're not trying to execute him, what did Henry Bowers have to look forward to? Yeah. No, and, and I mean, was it ultimately, like, if we're sitting here and we have people who have any doubts? Because, you know, if we have reasonable doubt... Yeah. That is when we do not convict, right? Yeah. If we have even cops with reasonable doubt about Henry Bowers, is it a kindness then to go, you know what? We're not going to send you to prison. We're just going to send you to a mental health facility for the rest of your life. Yeah. Where you will get to exist. One thing that I thought you might find interesting in this chapter, first of all, Henry's terrified of it. Because it, it starts, it shows up to get him, to bring him back out and winds him up about the losers being back. One of the things is, is he is insistent on having a nightlight at all times. Because when it's dark, things come out. They get in like a mist. Specifically oh. a mist. Okay. Yeah. But the light stops them. It stops the things and it stops this mist from creeping in and getting to him. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. I thought you might enjoy that. Yeah. The other thing that was interesting is because, like, it does show up. And in the movie, we see it show up as uh, Patrick Hofstadter. In the book, it's actually Belch who shows up. They, they break Henry out. But when he is sitting there trying his best to ignore it, he can communicate back. And, and it, like, tells him that it can communicate silently he can shine at it basically yeah and it encourages him to shine and have the conversation so that like the other people don't know because he, he does have like roommates and they're, they're kept in these like little groups of various like criminals who yeah. also are mentally unwell <laughs> it does tell him essentially that he needs one it tells him that the losers are back and that they're all these successful motherfuckers and gets him angry and there it's just like, well, and you're sitting in here rotting away, basically. And he keeps repeating to Henry that they don't believe enough, basically. And he needs Henry to go and remind them. Because he's like Tinkerbell and he needs them to clap. Yeah. Or he doesn't exist. <laughs> well, it doesn't exist, I should say. Not he. It's an it. Either way, uh, Henry... Gets out of Juniper Hills and makes his way back to Derry, too. Then, interesting shift. We actually get a little bit about Kay, uh, Beverly's friend who helped her get out. 
Tom shows up and beats the shit out of her, beats out the knowledge where Beverly is, and then makes his way to Derry, too. And then Audra, I think that's how uh, Bill's wife's name is pronounced. She basically breaks the news to the director that Bill has disappeared. The director's mad. And she ends up going as well to go find Bill. So she's also on her way to Derry. And in fact, uh, Audra and Tom end up staying in hotels next to each other with their cars facing each other. Though obviously they don't know that. They didn't arrive at the same times. I don't know what the importance of that's going to be, but it doesn't feel like it was no. just because. It, I imagine that King has some sort of intention with that because it is also pointed out that Tom knows that Beverly knew Bill and that Audra looks a lot like Beverly. If Beverly isn't going to tell people how she's treated, if Tom mistakes Audra for Beverly and pulls some stupid bullshit, it's all going to come out pretty quick, I imagine. Yeah, pretty much. So I, that's, that's kind of where I was wondering if we were going yeah. to. So then lastly, we get interlude three. And that gets back into dairy and the it history. Mike tells us that a massive sacrifice is needed to both end and begin the cycles. We are then told the story of the Bradley gang. Basically, the gang rolled up to dairy to hang low from the cops and the citizens of dairy executed vigilante justice. (laughs) When the group was in town to pick up some guns they had ordered, they were gunned down instead. Mr. Keene also mentions a clown sighting at this point that there was somebody who had seen a clown just floating. Yeah. Yeah, That is the sum of what we have read. It's a lot at the same time. Like it feels like we've slowed down significantly. Yeah. It's another section where I feel like there's a good portion that we probably could have cut. I agree. It was just a lot of repeating bits. Yeah. I think it would have made it flow better. I'm still trying to give benefit of the doubt that the amount of shit that's getting tossed out, it's going to be made up for later. But I do know this is a big criticism of King, that he just puts in so much extra. Yeah. No, I I agree, because, like, I... As I already mentioned, I've been reading Nosferatu by Joe Hill, his son. Yeah. Gotta say, I kind of favor Joe Hill's writing more because he doesn't... I don't feel as much like he's trying to hit a word count. Right. I don't feel like I'm just getting fluff I don't need. Now, I'm only halfway through the book, and it's still... It's almost a 700-page book. I'm somewhere over 400 pages right now. Yeah. So, I don't know. Maybe he's going to start getting real repetitive. But so far overall, I don't feel as much like I'm just getting filler. Yeah. So many sentences where a few sentences later, it's like the same thing gets said again. Yeah. And I just feel like a lot of that could have been cleaned up. Yeah, I completely agree. Content warning. Taryn is about to discuss the crimes of John Wayne Gacy. This is not a true crime podcast. So this is not extensive. However, it is still unsettling. If you'd like to skip this section, please jump to one hour and 25 minutes. Stay safe, our little lobsters. And to anyone still hanging around, please know this was chopped down a little bit as it was much longer. If interested, we can upload the full version as bonus content somewhere eventually. Let's step into True Crime Corner. Now, I I do want to make the caveat. This is not a true crime podcast. It is not. So this is not going to be perfect. This is going to be a quick overview. If if and when I ever make a true crime podcast, it would be a lot more comprehensive. There would be more. There would be better. I'm going over this really quickly because Stephen King likes to play with different horror tropes. And this book is is really hitting on everything that, you know, we've got werewolves, we've got vampires, like what kids find scary. Yeah. And then what is actually scary in the world. 
Serial killers are actually scary. They are real. They are real things that are horrifying. Yeah. Werewolves and vampires and the things that Stephen King generally writes about are not. These these people are both losers, actual losers, and actually horrifying. Now, I don't think that he wanted to. It is interesting that he calls out the Atlanta child murders. Yeah. Because he calls them out by name. He's putting it enough that it's calling out famous things that people would have really... People know about now and would have really known about at the time. Well, and I think that you're, you're right. Because I think he also wanted to use that to frame the importance of the uh, Castle Rock murders that Frank Dodd commits. Because he's also a serial killer. Yeah. And it, it's his fictional character juxtaposed, followed. Because, like, the sentence is, like, that guy up in Castle Rock who was murdering all those women and the Atlanta child murders. He, like... yeah crams it in there so it's like no you know now yeah. you know what kind of news frank dodd was yeah news doesn't come out of dairy but you know now what kind of news frank dodd's case was and you also know where your head should be at reading this here's here is all this supernatural shit here's what is actually scary and actually exists in the world yeah and is actual real like like this is what should be making you afraid Right? So I don't, I think the most obvious connection we can make, obviously, because without reading it, without with just looking at it, is John Wayne Gacy. He's the clown killer. It's a clown, there's a clown on the cover. Like, it's uh, obvious he's pulling from Gacy. So for our very first true crime corner, I looked at Gacy and I tried to look at what he may have found this was actually tough for me i listened to a shit ton of true crime gacy is apparently the line which was surprising for me but this was tough a lot of this information i actually got off of wikipedia the wikipedia is really well cited they have lots of actual sources books articles articles from the time everything that you could want so if you want to look into this more I'd say start there, scroll down to where all the resources are, and you'll find lists and lists and lists of everything you could want to give you a much better, clearer view yeah. of, of this. I wasn't deep diving this that way. Also, shout out to the podcast Morbid, episodes 134 and 137. I tried to listen to that, failed because as I said, apparently Gacy is the line. I've listened to some fucked up shit. Gacy is the line. <laughs> um, so what I want to start with is that despite so much of the media focusing on the clown aspect, Gacy didn't really actually do that that much. He was mostly inspired by another serial killer called Dean Coral. I'm not going into that that much. I don't know that much about Dean Coral and... It's not, not the day for it. There's a lot of information to get through really quick. His clown era, uh, John Gacy's clown era was long after his first offenses. And when I say his first offenses, I mean his first stint in prison. His clown era started in the middle of his murder era. Clown era also seems to me like it was more of an attempt to fit in. And when I say fit in, I mean serial killers, sociopaths, psychopaths have this tendency to try to, they're like mimicking normal life, both because they want to be normal and also because they don't want to be caught. It was an attempt to fit in. He had joined his local moose club at the time. They had a Jolly Joker club, which performed their clowns mostly did like charity functions. He made almost no money as a clown. And the only time that at least was on Wikipedia that he used a clown persona to do a crime was he did, he had two. One was Pogo the Clown. And he used Pogo to attempt to sexually assault David Cram in 1976. Again, this was deep in his murder era. The thing he more did was he 
ask if they wanted to see a trick. He would call these things like his clown tricks. But he'd ask, you want to see a trick? And then he'd handcuff his victims and then go, well, you're screwed now. You're handcuffed. Now you're mine. So to start, John Gacy suffered extreme emotional and physical abuse at the hands of his father, like Beverly. He had a heart condition and was told to avoid sports like Eddie. And due to this, he was overweight and unathletic like Ben. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, like, like I'm going through here. There's so many little things that really stuck out to me as... I, it just felt like they're sprinkled in. Mm-hmm. He was very, very close with his mother, like Eddie, <laughs> to the point where one of the leading, like, serial killer psychologists says that said that he could not psychologically separate himself from his mother. They were just kind of one and the same in his mind. Again, but very Eddie-like. To me. Once he left home, he worked at the Palm Mortuary in Las Vegas. Because he left home, he moved to Vegas. At that point, he confessed to crawling into one of the caskets and being... I, I will say it was... The way that I will put it is being inappropriate with the corpse of a teenage boy. After that, he returned home and failed up as only a white man can, especially in the fucking 1960s and 70s. He went to college with no diploma. <laughs> Then after he goes to college with no diploma, he gets married because of course he does. And right after he gets out of college, after getting fired from a fucking mortuary for for groping a corpse, his father-in-law buys three KFCs because he just did and goes, hey, you know what? Why don't you manage those? He, he And what does he do? He sets up a club in his basement and starts inviting his young workers over so that way he can hit on the teenage boys while he's married. Guess where that ends him? Convicted of sodomy for a minor. Now, he'd done it to a bunch of kids. He was only convicted for the one that was the son of a politician. And that was in 1968. He was diagnosed at that time by two doctors in a court-ordered psychiatric evaluation with antisocial personality disorder. At that time, antisocial personality disorder was what we call, like, we've been calling it sociopathy and psychopathy. Those names are starting to change. We're starting to look at those things different. At the time, it was called antisocial personality disorder. They said he would not benefit from treatment. It wouldn't help him, and he was absolutely going to reoffend. They were right that he was going to reoffend. I don't think today they would say he wouldn't benefit from treatment. I don't know. I'm not a doctor. I would hope that they wouldn't say that. Because how bleak would that be to be somebody who's basically told, you have no chance... You're gonna reoffend, and there's nothing we can do to stop you or help you. He got 10 years in prison. He served 18 months and got parole of, with 12 months probation. He served 18 months of a 10 year sentence for sodomy of a fucking minor, which it shouldn't, it was just sodomy pretty much, and it should have been rape of a minor. And it was more than one, but he only got convicted for one, and it was 18 months of a 10-year sentence. He got out of prison and pretty much immediately started offending again. He did lots more of that and went to jail again for that. And in the end, he murdered and was convicted of murdering at least 33 boys and men between the ages of 14 and 22. I know I'm skipping a lot here, but I'm I'm trying I, to I, not make this take forever. Yeah. Bas- it takes a long time to kill 33 he, fucking yeah. people. Well, he had he had a construction like he had a construction business and he would bring them he would offer people jobs there and he would also let them like stay at his house 
and he'd kill them that way. He also, he would lure victims from the Greyhound station, which I thought was really interesting because we should have see the Greyhound station in the book, which felt like a really poignant, like, like thing for King to, like, put there. And what he generally, he would do the, do you want to see a trick? He murdered and was convicted of murdering at least 33 boys and young men between the ages of 14 and I believe 22. 26 were crammed into the crawl space of his house. The number could be as high as 45 because he had started to dump bodies into the river because he had ran out of space. Even in the last few years, they're finding bodies that they're attributing to him in a different river. That's why that number is going up and he's never... He, before he was executed, he never confessed or, or said how many, when they asked how many, he basically said, that's for you to find out because he was terrible. Some victims were conned into believing Gacy was a policeman. That also stuck out to me because in the book, that cop had felt really off. Off. All except the final two were murdered between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m., which felt really specific and maybe even ritualistic. Some serial killers are ritualistic. It's almost like how addicts have rituals that they yeah. do and it's part of the getting high process. They're getting high off of what they're doing too, so it has to be done a certain way. He attempted to convince the doctors that he had multiple personality disorder. He claimed to have four personalities, and this is straight from Wikipedia, so this is a straight quote. Uh, he claimed to have four personalities, the hardworking civic-minded contractor, the clown, the active politician, and a policeman named Jack Hanley, whom he referred to as Bad Jack. When Gacy had confessed to police, he claimed to be relaying the crimes of Jack, who detested homosexuality and viewed male prostitutes as weak, stupid, and degraded scum. That's a straight quote, because I... Still mess up sometimes, but generally I would say male sex yeah. workers. So yeah. I just wanted to make that clear. Jack Hanley, I, I ended up bolding so I would really remember that. I realize it's Hanlin, but that also stuck yeah. out to me. And then Jack, too. Now, Stephen King's been using the name Jack for a long time, but Gacy was arrested in a... Oh, gosh, I want to say 76, 78-ish. And Jack keeps getting used. And the fact that it's a multiple personality, and King also started using multiple personalities all the time, was interesting to me. And now for everybody who is as disgusted and upset and horrified by Gacy as I am, I will say, usually... I don't support the death penalty, but there are special cases. <laughs> there are special cases within the special cases. And I would like you all to know that his execution was botched and the drugs solidified in the line and it should have taken five minutes and it took 18 for him to die. They had to redo the line. So he had to lay there in the bed, like knowing he was about to die and it was still an easier death than anything he gave any of his victims. But for somebody who had no, he never showed an ounce of like regret or anything. He never took responsibility for any of it. He felt like the victim till the end. He had to lay there and it should have taken him five minutes to die, but they knock you out first. They knock you out earlier than that. Then they stop your breathing. Then they stop your heart. The drug solidified and he had to sit there and wait and wait and wait. Fuck John Wayne Gacy. He deserved it. And also, in, and this is another quote from Wiki. In 1984, Sam Amarante, Amarante authored procedures that were incorporated by the Illinois General Assembly into the Missing Child Recovery Act of 1984. At the time of the Gacy murders, Illinois police had to wait 72 hours before initiating a search for a missing child or adolescent. The Missing Child Recovery Act removed this waiting period. Other states subsequently adopted similar procedures. As a result, 
a national network aimed at locating missing children was gradually formed. This has since developed into the child abduction emergency, commonly known as an Amber Alert. They turned this into something that has saved countless lives. It's wonderful, at least. Yeah, and that fucker suffered. Yeah. So. He did. I don't believe you need to read most of chapter three. You should read interlude three. Okay. Um, I'm not doing it nearly enough justice uh, because it it's kind of long, but it, it literally goes into like what the crimes of the Bradley gang had done. And we've already had some degree of the fact that it is dairy. Yeah. Pennywise is dairy, which leads me to your multiple personalities comment about Gacy because we have it. We have dairy. We have Pennywise, the clown and we have uh, Bob Gray. Yes. Yeah. So basically it takes possession of them because the Bradley gang, they're bad people. They, they are criminals, right? They're hiding out because they think that they can't be found here because they had actually done crimes down south. And basically one of them comes in, orders a bunch of guns. The guy who's selling the guns recognizes them and says, okay, yeah, some of the stuff you want, though, I won't have it till tomorrow. And basically gets the town together with the intent of when they're out there, we're going to shoot them. We're not going to arrest them. Yeah. We're just not going to shoot them. (laughs) And that is what had actually sparked the previous one before 58, the one from like the thirties, which the reason I I mentioned this is because it's the picture that Bill and Richie find. It's a picture essentially because Mr. Keene mentions that Bill's dad had been seen walking up the street with another boy, Zach. Zach and some other kid. Basically up the street where all of this was about to take place. So that picture is essentially just before the Bradley gang rolls into town because they've cleared everybody out because everybody's hiding with their guns. So that it can take possession, which is why he's floating, watching it all and feeding off of it. It it feels like the idea is... It feeds on the hatred and the anger, and then it feeds more. It's like a feedback loop almost. Yeah. As a palate cleanser (laughs) after that shit. Yeah. uh, I'm going to talk about cardamancy. Uh, Because remember, Mike pulls out a brand new deck of cards sealed in the package. Like he's pulling like packaging out so that he can even get into this box of cards. Brand new deck of cards so they can put some cards into the spokes essentially of silver. The deck falls and two cards land face up. Now I think just about anybody who who does put some degree of faith into stuff like this is going to tell you the face up ones are important. Yeah. And it's two Two of spades, something that should not happen because it's a brand new deck of cards and we have a duplicate. So we're already off to a, this is weird. So even if you know nothing about occult and fortune telling through cards, you know that this is weird. Two, two of spades do not exist within a deck of cards. It would ruin your game of solitaire. It truly would. Cardamancy, like you already know we participate in tarot at the end of every episode. Cardamancy is where that was born from. It's the the original. When you just use a regular 52 deck of cards, because a tarot deck has like 78 cards, I believe, because you have the major arcana. Regular cards don't do that. You get 13 of every suit, and then some decks have the like jokers. So you should, in theory, have have like normal cards, and then you have tarot cards. We've talked before about like how you could convert. But there is still a branch of the of fortune telling that comes from just using a regular 52 deck of cards as they are. They are not interchangeable. You could kind of find some similarities between them, but honestly, they're they're pretty different if you if you were to take regular 52 deck cards and a set of tarot cards, they're just not gonna necessarily one for one it. So, first of all, the two of spades, in general, is considered a warning. Spades are often considered bad omens, uh, similar to how, like, swords are considered bad cards. 
they're not really bad cards. They're cards, guys. They're not bad. They're not inherently bad. It's a really simplified way to look at it, honestly. Yeah, but I got the death card. That means I'm going to die. <laughs> Anything can be bad when you put a value on it. But change can be good or bad. And often fear is really what the problem is, is that we're afraid of something, so we consider it now bad. Spades in general represent a challenging task, such as defeating a monster. Let's consider the you know, the movies, the the 2017 and 2019 movies, Beverly actually defeats and considers it a way to kill monsters. The spade tipped spoke oh, yeah. from the fence. That is what a spade is. If anybody doesn't know, it's the tip of that, that iron like piece that she has from the gate that she ends up stabbing through it and gives to Eddie to protect himself. Um, and she says it slays monsters. So I I don't know if they still use that thing because we haven't gotten there yet. But if they do, I imagine that's part of why we're getting the two of spades <laughs> or at least a spade. Two also implies that while something is working against you, you have an opportunity to come out on top. The two of spades itself as its own card does suggest that a tough decision is going to come up. And that there is deceit and change on the horizon. Deceit in particular is a really big, like, push here. We haven't finished the story, but we do know that it can be whatever it wants to be. Which is how all of them kind of started out in this place, is just seeing something familiar become unfamiliar. We have two cards that are making it very clear that we are going to have a very challenging task. We are down one person because without Stan, we do not have our complete circle that was formed the first time. Their coven is short a person. So we go from seven of them originally then. Yeah, we go from a seven pointed star to a six pointed star. So next, next time we're going to be reading. <laughs> I don't know where the I don't know where the scene is. I have a feeling it's it's coming very soon. I know that it happens after the children defeat it. I will try to find out specifically where so you can skip it if you do not want to see the scene. I don't know for certain that it's actually in the next part we're going to read, but I know we're coming up towards it. And the best I can do is try and get everybody ready. We will be reading part four, but not all of it. We are going to be reading through chapter 15. We'll finish this book someday. I'm not, I, I'm not going to lie. I used up all my steam yelling about Gacy. I'm, well, I'm you know what? Let's of... just let, let's, let, let's pull our fucking card and right. know what our future holds. Eh. <laughs> 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 It's a Ten of Cups. So if anybody remembers from the last time we got the Ten of Cups, because we actually have gotten this one before. Have we really? Yes. Uh, the Ten represents contentment with relationships. As the Nine shows individual satisfaction, the Ten shares it with others. Oh, huh, okay. And we do need a circle. We need a coven in order to defeat it. And we we should be gearing up for a much closer encounter soon i believe in terms of the book which is why i have to warn you about the scene what it also means is start commenting on our social media join our socials love us why don't you love us just let us rule you, Do you know love? <laughs> <laughs> oh god fear me love me let me rule you and i will be your slave No. <laughs> I don't I don't remember how the rest of that quote goes, so no. <laughs> it's not only forever, funny. not long at all. That's not the rest of that quote, it's just I feel like the best way to follow that up. That gives big everything about all the vibes. <laughs> oh my god, I just had like a moment of like did the man in black and Jareth know each other? Like, hot. Uh, yeah, right? 
<laughs> like, mm, fan fiction. <laughs> Oh my god, I I need to. You know what? You gotta go find the other worlds because I'm tired now and I have to go. My mommy says I have to go. So <laughs> your mommy says your zaddy. You, my zaddy <laughs> says you have to go to your own other worlds because I have to go now. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>